find your name, and then you'll let you see the credits. So uh, you can have those. So let me introduce Mr. John Furlock, uh, President and CEO of Smarter Risk Management. Thank you. Okay, thank you. This is round two. This is going to be interesting. These four years up. Back to that. Basically, see how many are left to do the last session. All these people are just going to secretly duck out of the ass and get all that food. But uh, thank you for your time. Uh, we've got John Herlock. I uh, run a firm called Smarter Risk Management. Smarter is an acronym that we use. Um, so it's not just this uh, name we thought was, uh, I guess, clever or whatever. But it stands for, from a risk perspective, we're a risk consulting firm. Subject, manifestation, actions, results testing, expectations, review. And so the reason we use the campus smarter is that we, we used to talk to people about things like COSO, and they'd look at us and say, huh, what's COSO? They'd say, what's well, a committee on sponsoring organizations, of course. The Treadway Commission, huh, what's that? So this has helped in some respects uh, to help people grasp some of the uh, various components of risk um, in that process. So today we're going to talk about a triple model validation. I've uh, been involved in model validation in, in, uh, in various areas for the last uh, several years. Um, and uh, what I'm going to do is share with you some background information and then I'm going to share with you just some actual, kind of like little bullets from actual validations we've done. Some things that we found that probably need to be improved upon or need to be fixed. So we'll go through that. I've been going, I've been in this going through this process, I, mean, I guess I've been involved in banking for 30 plus years. Uh, you stop after 30, you start adding a plus in after that. But the first 15 years in banking, the last 15 plus years in consulting. Uh, so uh, hopefully I can bring to you some of, the, some of my experiences uh, that I've had throughout that process, um, going back to uh, when we used to um, calculate the allowance in the mid 1980s. Uh, I always get accused of sandbagging. So today's in mind. Um, so overview, we're gonna talk a bit about correlations. Uh, we, heard today this, we heard this morning about correlations and they were sort of just uh, handed out there, right? So all you have to do is correlate the data. It's all fine, it all works. Correlations are not quite that easy and we'll talk a bit about, you know, but you can use some of it for information purposes. It'll help you with some of the information that, that you need. We'll talk about the findings from validations, we'll talk about the allowance validation, the process, and then we'll conclude and let you take a break and go on to your next session. Go to the pool. I'm not sure which, we'll do a vote at the end, the pool or the next sessions. <laughs> All right. So when I was looking into this, because I talked about validation here two years ago, and just sort of talked about the initial how to do it and why you're doing it. And this time around, I thought, well, I'm going to share an extra example, so let's talk about the history of it. History, the reserve for bad debts. Few banks, and this is directly from an OCC document, by the way, do not provide uh, citations. This is from the uh, allowance uh, background from like 1993. Um, few banks provided reserves for bad debts until the IRS allowed the addition to such reserves to be tax deductible. So I I'd like to put that in there because I was just picturing the conversation between the banks and regulators at that time. We'd like you to reserve, okay? We'd like you to create a reserve. Nah, we, we really don't want to reserve. We don't, we'd really like you to. How about we make it tax deductible? Oh yeah, then we'll reserve. Would that happen in today's environment? Probably not, right? We don't want to do that. Now that's not good. We don't want to do the Cecil thing. Let's stick with what we're doing, but thanks for offering. We appreciate that. It's a little different environment, isn't it? And then in 1975 and 6, FASB and the banking regulators began issuing the guidance on the all and it's evolved ever since. So until we went down the new CISO, we heard a lot this morning about how that's being created, so I'm not going to go through any of that really. One of the things that, I am not an accountant, and I'm not an auditor. So these four things, I'm, I'm not a regulator either. So these four, I'm more on the risk side of things. And I have been involved in some of the, as, as you heard this morning, some of the international uh, work. I've been involved in some of the Basel II and, and, uh, and some of the risk documentation internationally, but I'm kind of more from a risk perspective. So if people have specific accounting questions, we do have specific accountants around here. And validation, by the way, is not really a accounting or an audit process. It's more determining how you're using the model, what's going on with that. So from an accounting perspective, 
Why do we, what, what's the accounting view of this? The representation of the financials, right? Is it accurate, is it true, is it fair? Do we give you the proper information? Accountants value precision. Get that right number. Uh, risk people value accuracy. Now, not that they're mutually exclusive, but if we're within five or 10 million, we're okay. That's fine. Directionally, we were good, so we're at the right place. Yeah, but it didn't flip back. Yeah, plenty of stuff. Thus, there is often conflict and discussion between you probably internally between the people doing the uh, models and the people running the accounting system. And you'll find that will continue out in this process. Audit, audit is there for assurance. So from an audit perspective, I ask the question of this, can you have a valid model and can you fail an audit? What do you think? Can you have a valid model? Yes, you can. Because the model can produce and transform the data correctly, but the controls and the environment around it may be poor. And in fact, when we talk about the all right now, one of the things we find is that the models actually have not very much weight in the current environment because a lot because of how many sets of eyes look at it. So we'll talk a bit about using the model and, and what we like to see. The regulatory standpoint, safety and soundness, protecting the system. So you may have gone through the crisis and you may have had no loan losses, you may be perfect, everything, and you may still, and your reserve may be up here, right? In fact, it, in most models today, if you if you took out the key factors and you took out the analysis <coughs> equation, where would your reserve direction be in most banks? Substantially down, wouldn't it? Why aren't you there? Why aren't you substantially down? Why are you building it back up? The economy is improving, unemployment's down. You have a, a, a what, what's going on here? Safety and soundness. That's right. Volatility. And also, I will also say that what I find in the, in the allowance model, and it's, it's a fairly subjective process right now, and there's often not a lot of good support for why you choose and pick the numbers that you pick. So why are your Q factors a 0.25 instead of a 0.15? Why, are the, you know, why do you have an unallocated portion? Why do you have all these different things? What, is, what represents it? Well, here's some information here, but how, how do you establish that to be true? One way is to begin looking at things like correlations to help you there. Correlations are not the perfect or, or end all answer because things can correlate and they can still be untrue. So you have to be able to be explained beyond it. But, um, and then the area of risk, accurate but not precise. You know, are we capturing the risks that go along with this? Are we, uh, are we reserving appropriately for troubled loans? Do we have sufficient capital to support our organization? Things like that. Everyone, or, I, I, I don't know if I've been asked this question here, and forgive me, but by the time I get to the fourth one, I'll be saying things over and over and over again. It'd be like being with my kids. My kids, I'll tell them a story, they'll say, Dad, you told that yesterday. It's like, you know, that's the beauty of getting old. I can tell stories again, they're brand new to me. Um, so, uh, so um, how many of you have had an examiner walk into your go through the examination process and say to you, have you validated your allowance model yet? Anybody had that in here? A few of you? that, you'll probably hear more and more of that. And again, I, what I think is going on is I think that there's a, that there's a push towards um, um, getting a better handle on the models such that as things do evolve into the CISO world, that which will be much more, which will be much stronger modeling, you'll have better support there. But technology is one of the drivers. Now, technology with respect to the allowance, how many of you are doing a, a, an Excel-based model right now? How many of you are doing an Excel-based model for your, um, your uh, asset and liability management? How many in 1990 were doing an Excel-based model for asset and liability management? I was. Why were we able to do that at that point? The, the drivers of the results were fairly simple. We did what we call a cliff event. Interest rates are going up by 300 basis points. Ding, ding, ding. Bing, tomorrow it's up by 300 basis points. Forecast it out. You bring everything up, you take it out. Very simple model. But, and within the allowance right now, it still has some relatively, you know, the, the models right now do a good job of archiving, 
and they do a good job of pulling data together and force them to be systematic in how you analyze things. Um, as we go along, the models will become more important and that I believe there'll be a larger uh, migration to using software models to, um, to, to, uh, uh, to calculate the allowance. Of course, the crisis, crisis helped a lot of things. In fact, some people say the models caused the crisis. There's, uh, there's a certain amount of belief out there that uh, some of the uh, uh, models uh, might have been one of the driver behind that. But, uh, and then of course, preparation for moving from the incurred to the expected loss process. Now, as we talk about model risk management and interval validation, just here are some of the models that you have inside your bank and that you're gonna, you know, that you, that you look at. This is the <laughs> one that has been through the longest process of validation. I would say for the, for the last five to 10 years, I would say, there, there's been a process of validation out there. It's a pretty, pretty standard role right now. Asset liability management. Um, and prior to that, you know, it was, it was more of these cliff event type models and you fell off the cliff. What do you do right now with asset liability management models? What do you, how do you, how do you model these things? Interest rates are gonna go up by 300 basis points. Okay, they're gonna go up 100 basis points next quarter. We're gonna reprice loans in the second quarter. In the third quarter, we're going to reprice deposits, and here are the results that we're going to have over time. So we're doing a lot more realistic modeling in this process. We're trying to get a lot more realism into this process. Um, we just validated a, uh, uh, the other one that's interesting right now is the anti-money laundering validations. Those are beginning to get fast and furious, as it were. Is the data correct? The model, we need to, we're doing something. That just, just seems right. And we actually just validated a, uh, a call report model. Anybody consider their call report to be a model? Can anybody use any of the systems that are provided by the core vendors to populate their call report and bring in and do various calculations? Does anyone know? You probably do. Who typically signs off on that? Your external auditors? Yeah. CFO? Then your external auditors review it at some point as you're filing off of that. And then who signs off on your AOOA model? Once a year. External auditors? What are they signing off on? The controls, the assurance that somebody's doing. So there's just the different types of models that are out there. What could go wrong with a model, and we don't find a lot of this right now with, uh, with the allowance, because it's what I will call, uh, we, we talk about this as, as a, the allowance process or model of being effective but not very efficient. What do I mean by that? How many people sign off on an allowance before it gets put through there? How many how many different sign-offs are there? Usually, usually three to five. Yeah. So you run the results, let's say you're running MSD or SageWorks, you get the results out, you put them in a different report, report formatting, you probably then change the numbers because you don't like what came out of the model, you then pass it on to the CFO, the CFO says, yeah, I'm not quite sure there's enough provisioning, let's change this and go back. So you do all this work outside the model, and then there's a third. So it's not a very efficient process. But fundamentally, it's pretty effective. And one of the goals is gonna to be to make the models, the software models, I think, allow them to become more efficient to get that end result. Um, different things that can happen in the model. <clears throat> By the way, in validating a model, it is very rare to have a model be declared invalid. I'll tell you that right now. Why do you think that is? I think it would be very difficult to say the nature of low model is invalid. Well, you don't have any structural mechanism to structurally work. Well, and, and what would have to be materially wrong inside the model to make it invalid? Um, essentially, um, as I said, is it, is it effective, not very efficient? Or at the end of the day, the numbers are getting reported. Do you have a lot of eyes looking at them and a lot of different calculations that occur to get you a valid result. An invalid result would mean basically that you've got a $2 million loan portfolio and you're reserving $2 million for it. You're reserving nothing. Well, that might be an invalid calculation out of that. But the eyes look at it, don't they? They try to judge it. So a lot of that that goes on there. So every model, though, is wrong. Okay. At the end of the day, every model's wrong. A static view of a dynamic future using history as our guide 
History is a guide of a very difficult thing in today's environment, isn't it? How many of you use 20 plus quarters of historical information in calculating out, let's say, your, your reserves? Okay. How many of you use eight quarters on that? Anybody in here? Five quarters? Some banks use a few, some banks use a lot. That length of time of history is really important. In other words, if you have your losses from the crisis in there, as well as your current no losses at all, you've got a very volatile set of data. Um, do you weight the most current things? Do you not weight it? So there's all sorts of things in that history. And one of the keys to that is to support why you pick the history you pick. Why do you do that? How do you typically pick a history? So how do you pick a history for your for your allowance? We picked our starting point as we need to start getting data. Okay. Okay. There you go. And then we have a full economic cycle. We would be we can determine the expenditures. Okay. So you have a ten year economic cycle of using your historical data to calculate your allowance. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you are through the cycle model mm -hmm. as opposed to a point in time model. So I mean, but everybody's taking a different approach in that. So. Um, internal experts. The allowance is still a very strongly a subjective model at the end of the day. Um, and as, as a consequence, one of the things that's a real challenge, in fact, some people say it's impossible, is, is to backtest an allowance model. Why is it impossible to backtest an allowance model? Would you backtest Well, you could do that, but the question is, is the subjective decision making in there? How do I back test that subjectivity? How do I back test your change in periods of time or weights or things like that? How do I do that? Unless you can plug your brain into the system, that's sort of thing. Uh, you can do the totality based on what you were saying, what your loss history is uh -huh. versus what you said they were going to be, and how, how they correlate, and what, but the individual components that got you there. Yeah, yeah. A true back test would say we're basically going to take your take the model, run it against a different period of time, and we'll see how the results turn out to have some type of validity within them. And you can't do that because a different period of time, you would have had different factors because you would have put them in because you believe things are differently. So that you can't really address. Okay. Model requirements. Um, statement of purpose on models intended use. We do often find there's a lack of documentation um, in there, documented methodologies, substance calculations, and model integrity. What is model integrity? There are definitions for these type of things. Model integrity, when I say there's integrity, does it have data integrity, transformation integrity, or information integrity? And really fundamentally, when you look at a, when you look at a, a validated model, you're looking at those components. Is the data integrity, is it the right source? How does it transform itself? What do you do with the output? Oops. Correlations. So correlations. Um, a little, little uh, brief thing on correlations. So what is a correlation? We talk about it. We heard a lot mentioned this morning. We just have to go back and correlate the data, and it comes forward. Correlation means if something is strongly positively correlated, what does it mean? Two data points. What does it mean? It means if this data point occurs here, there's a strong likelihood that this data point might be here, and if they change, they're going to go in some type of continuous, they move in a positive and direction consistently for whatever period of time they're correlating. Okay. So um, if you, that would be referred to a perfect correlation as a plus one value. So it says plus one, it's perfectly correlated. The numbers move, it's a straight line heading out. So this goes up, this goes up. Perfect negative correlation is a minus one. If this goes up, this goes down. And that's the correlation concept in our data set. What does a zero correlation mean? Value zero. That would mean random relationship, no, right. no path. This, no idea, right. <laughs> we, and, uh, and so when we talk about correlations, just because something is correlated at a 0.6 or 0.7 versus a 0.8 or 0.9, we'll say 0.9 is strongly correlated, 0.8 is less strongly correlated. We don't say it's 20 or 30 percent better than the other one, we just say it's strong or less strong. So it's somewhat subjective. And correlation, of course, deals with periods of time. 
One of the problems we're going to have in doing all of this is going to be having enough data. If we were doing correlations on market data, let's say we're running some, if you were to value at risk, value at risk models, we use 252 data points. That's every business day in a year in New York. Why two, and so how do we get 252 data points on the lending portfolio? So you can, days aren't gonna work, are they? <laughs> how do the loan change from day to day? It changes month to month, doesn't it? Month to month, quarter. so 252 months, 23 years. So when you've got your 23 years worth of data collected, you're all set to run the model, we're okay with it. Obviously there are ways to deal with that and ways to address it. But sometimes what I like about correlations is that they can give you some good ideas about how the bank manages its problem assets and how it reserves. Because the reserve is really all about managing problem assets, isn't it? Recognition of problem assets. And what we find is that when there are some pretty strong correlations, banks tend to manage them better. And when there are some weak correlations, banks tend to manage them worse. So I've got some charts here, and, and um, these are not correlation charts. In other words, they're not correlated values. These are historical charts over seven years. Seven data points, not a really good statistical data set, but it can give you an idea. Again, when you're validating something, you're trying to get the idea of how it works. So this is what's known as a leading correlation. What we did is we validated the allowance to the total charge off. So how should this work in the allowance to a total charge off? Which <coughs> should go up and down first? The allowance, right? In theory, the allowance should go up first and then the charge off should follow. And this is, when you look at the data here, this is a positive a leading correlation of that. The charge offs went up. Now in this case, unfortunately, the charge offs were at the same point that the bank kind of ran out of capital, and so they had to find a little bit more in there. But at least they were positively correlated to the process. The point is, there was a recognition that there were problems. It's just at the end of the day, the problems were overwhelming. And, and not an uncommon story. And then what you do is you look at peers also. So you try to say, what, what typically we ask is, we ask banks to, to define a peer group for us. So banks will say, well, we use the UDPR peer group. Really? So you go and look at the banks in the UDPR peer group or some of the public ones. So we'll see banks in um, North Carolina in the same peer group as a downtown Los Angeles bank. So I mean, if you look at the banks that are in there, from a national systemic environment, they probably may have some value, but from a from that local economic value, there's really not a lot of value there. So we ask banks to give us a peer group of, of, of like banks to them. And uh, so we, we do that just to, just to look at the differences in the losses. Um, but if you can't find one in your local area, that's why it's good. If you're well, looking at your composition of your portfolio or other things. That makes you an outlier. <laughs> I'm just kidding, not, not, not an outlier like outline, but it's basically it just means that you, typically what most banks have are a set of banks they look at and say, we like this bank, we compare ourselves to this bank. So maybe, and then the thing is you can do common size formatting so it can be bigger or smaller. So maybe your total commercial bank, no, no consumer loans at all, maybe your total consumer bank, and you can find things like that. But you try to find ones that are somewhat similar to what you would like. But it's a challenge in some cases. This one is a, a concurrent correlation. That means that basically as things change, <coughs> In this case, we got the allowance, and we use net charge-offs. I just pulled these graphs out for different examples. You go go back and forth between net charge-off and total charge-off uh, for the year. The reason is sometimes net charge-off encompasses losses from prior accounting periods. And so the question is, are you reserving for the current accounting period, or are you reserving to catch up to something that's been prior or in the future? It's one of the challenges. Um, anyway, this one basically says, as the loan loss allowance changes, the charge offs have changed at the same time. So what does that mean? That means basically, um, essentially that they are recognizing the losses, but they're also charging off pretty quickly. Could mean one of two things. It either means that 
The bank is very active in its charge-off process. So in other words, it's very aggressive in charging off loans. It doesn't make different. Or it could mean that they're just uh, maybe slow in recognizing problem loans. Again, this just gives us information. Um, negative correlation, this one was kind of interesting. Turned out that the strongest correlation was to your yield portfolio um, to the allowance. Uh, what does that mean? That means the bank, through the crisis, as they would recognize that they had more going into ORE, they would pump up their allowance. You know, they would be adding into the adding into the portion to try to support it. Uh, and, and and one of the you know, uh, one of the famous philosopher Mike Tyson, you've heard of him, <laughs> has a very good quote. He says, "Everyone has a plan to get hit until they get hit," <laughs> and that's very true for the crisis, isn't it? Some banks. So this bank. In, in, in general, has a very poor allowance process. They're very slow in recognizing them. Um, they, uh, they, they just don't have a good handle over how to manage it. So again, we just pulled this together as part of validation. You know, I'd encourage you to go back and look at your own bank and say, how do we reserve and how do we see our losses occur? Are we, um, it's, an interesting, it's an interesting exercise to look at. And how do we correlate? How do we correlate? Um, this is one we just did. This is a systemic comparison. And this just gives you an idea from that peer group. <clears throat> Essentially, this top line here are the max within the peer group. So basically, every, every quarter, we took the max in that peer group, and we, we tracked that. And then we took the average, took the median, um, took the minimum, so there's the minimum. And then we took the bank, which is right here in the middle. That also gives you an idea of the riskiness of the bank and the risk profile of the bank. So we use this in validation process because we have to learn how the bank approaches its problem asset management, how it gets things into the allowance, and how it and how it factors it through. Okay. The next thing I'm going to talk about are issues. This is just a general list of issues that we have when we run through this process. Um, again, going back to the model validation approach, very straightforward, purpose, inputs, transformation, outputs. We don't, in a validation, and if you're having a validation done um, by, by anyone, I would encourage you, if, you're, if you have a good audit process, internal audit, and a good loan review process, and they've already said this too, but I, but if you have those, the validation should not repeat those. It's not the validator's job to go in and revalidate the underwriting of loans if you have a good loan review process. And it's not the validator's responsibility to necessarily look at the controls if you've had a control, a control audit done on your model process. They're there to look at how the, is the model valid? Does it transform the data and do you get the output and can you use it in a timely fashion? So how might I determine if a loan review process is solid? How might I, if an external person coming in, how do I figure that out? What do I do? Do you have the regulator um, their reviews of your asset quality uh, ratings as compared to what your own loan review process is doing? And I also look at the number of downgrades that occur by the external by, by, a, by a loan review function or um, outside of the normal process. So if I go in and I see, and I also look at multi-grade downgrades. So if I go in and I see loan, grade, <coughs> loan review is doing two and three down, grade downgrades, I don't have a lot of faith in the underwriting process or the, or the problem loan management, which would affect then the validation. But I look at it, but I don't go in and retest the loans. That's not my job in the validation. So findings, overall. Excel models are a problem as banks grow. Um, and it, it is interesting as you go into banks that have grown substantially, how they handle their Excel models because oftentimes it can be a near panic environment. Because how do, they, how do most banks grow? They acquire. And what information do you bring in an acquisition? Just enough to process the loan. <laughs> you don't bring in historical loan defaults, you don't bring in that, you say, let's get the loan on our books and let's process it. Um, 
But as banks grow, the Excel models, um, as a bank grows, it really is better to go to a uh, third party, uh, third party uh, uh, model provider, because what does that do for you? It provides you a, a systematic way of collecting your data, it provides you with a, a consistent data source, and it provides you with a uh, consistent set of outputs without having to expand or change. Now, I don't work for MST. You know, I, 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 we validate their models. We also validate models for SageWorks. You know, we validate Excel models. So we've done all the different types of models. But we find that, uh, in general, the uh, Excel models are a challenge. This next one's rather interesting because I, this has been pretty consistent among, um, especially banks less than, uh, I want to say less than three billion, maybe in that range. Um, that there's a real lack of a project plan to convert. So you go in and you say, okay, well, how did you go from one model to the next? And, and occasionally they hear, well, we built the data, we turned it on, and we started running it. Okay. <laughs> well, how did you get your assumptions in there? How did you build all that? Well, we just sort of, we're not quite there yet. So what we do is we run the model, then we go back to our Excel model to run everything through there again to make sure it's all working okay. How long have you been doing this? Two or three years now. That's just, we just converted recently, so we'll get around to changing sooner or later. Um, project plan, showing your work, supporting it is really important. It's very helpful in model validation to show that work. Um, Over-reliance on software vendors for knowledge. Um, and uh, it may be funny to be at a software conference talking about that, but uh, you, know, you are responsible for your own assumptions, your own loss periods, your own loss conversion, that's all your data, your information. And if you're told by someone that this is the best practice, this is what we do, you better make sure you understand why it's the best practice and what it's supposed to do. Why do you wait this most recent quarter four, four times? Well, because we're told it's the best practice. So that doesn't really carry enough, that, that doesn't really tell me you understand the model, you don't understand the results. Uh, Lack of a transition plan to a new model. Who in here is a SOS fan? Anybody here SOS? Okay. How many quarters do you have to run things in parallel? Two. And then plan to turn off the old one. It's really important to turn off the old one at some point because people don't. And, and I, I heard this comment just a, 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 um, earlier today. Actually, someone said, "Well, you know, our, our, our directors are really comfortable with the, with the Excel model, but we're running we're running out of soup." So you run both. Well, yeah, we run both. So you really rely on our Excel models to really give the results on. So you're doing two models per quarter, and how do you validate that? Which model's right? Which one's wrong? So it's, 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 a, it's an interesting situation. Um, accounting for acquired loans. Uh, every, uh, I'm gonna turn that over to the accounting people who are here in the program, but that is every, uh, there are different requirements out of different firms on how you can account for those, on whether you can bring them into your own books at some point, because you were able to write them. Some say yes, some say no. And of course, the last one's lack of documented procedures. It does not need to be a book. It does not need to be a 100-page book, but it needs to be documented the procedures that go along with your assumptions. Okay, how many of you have seen this kind of chart on the FDIC website? How many of you have seen it? <laughs> One of the things that's interesting in here, and we find this when we talk to banks about losses, is this comment over here. All other loans, including non-impaired, individually evaluated loans. <coughs> so how many of you individually evaluate non-impaired loans? In here. Why might you do that? Why might you, why might, instead of just running it through a pool environment, why might you individually evaluate a loan that's not impaired? Anybody? It might be a one-off, you know, a huge loan that's a one-off, you might exactly. have a participation structure. Because if you're a pure commercial bank, like one bank you work with, the average loan is 1.2 million, it's a commercial bank, and they have what I call chunky losses, right? So when they take a loss, it's a chunk. Well, they were, they were told, by their, uh, by their regulator that they needed at least 30 pools for this portfolio. Some of the pools are empty. Some of them have never had anything in them. And then when they had a major loss because they were doing the general allocation, guess what? 
and wiped out a majority of their majority of their allowance. So what happened? Well, they went under order <laughs> because they weren't modeling correctly. But I've, I've shown this to a number of different bankers, and they're just well, we didn't know we could do that. And you all may know this, and you're may be aware of it, but uh, um, the next thing I say is run it by your accountants as well. Make sure your accountants are comfortable with this approach because you need to make certain that they. Uh, that they are that they're okay with it. But yeah, you can, I mean, we're, think about it, we're talking about incurred losses, we're talking about, and it doesn't matter if you're either a pool or impaired, it matters that you understand what the loss components are of that particular type of credit. So here are some comments that came out of, uh, that come out of different, um, different validations we've done, just general one-liners type of things you've seen. This first one in the policy with the last date of update was 2006. Maybe things have changed. And um, in, this, in this case, this organization, ironically, uh, it's not really been picked up through many other, you know, we're saying, and the policy, was it, was it okay? It was very deficient, uh, very weak. Um, but you know, it, it, it was, you should be updating your policy when you, in, in an annual process at least. This next one, the all, this is directly out of the policy statement. Just one sentence. The all must be maintained with a sufficient level to absorb expected or unexpected losses from the portfolio. What's wrong with that sentence? <coughs> the all must be maintained at a sufficient level to absorb expected and unexpected losses from the portfolio. It, it's not an unexpected loss, right? That's not the purpose of that. Now that statement's in the policy, so then we dig a little further. Why is it in the policy? Well, we had a third party write the policy for us. We accept it as written. What does that tell me as a validator? You may not have enough knowledge about the model that you're running, because you may not understand the purpose of it. I mean, it's a very basic thing. You're saying, John, it's just a sentence. But it's a sentence stating what you're intending to do. So if I were validating as a true, in a true validation process, I would validate to expected and unexpected losses from portfolio. And guess what? They're massively under-reserved for unexpected losses. Okay, that's that thing called capital. Um, okay, roles and responsibilities do not match reality. Sometimes we find in policies it says, well, this is looked at by such and such, and signed off by such and such, and then you go and look at what's going on, and it's looked at by such and such. And by the way, they don't hand it off to anybody else. They just keep things going. So their intent, they're stating to get the model working is that you have to have these sets of eyes look at it and review it, only says that one set of eyes looks at it. Um, portfolio structure. Um, we find these pools driven by the regulators. I throw that in here as a general comment, but the fact is, um, through the examination process, I think an examiner will come in and maybe say, okay, we need to create a pool for this, and create a pool for that. And I don't often hear, well, why, what should we do to, how do you prove that pool correlates and is valid? Often I hear is we'll create the pool. And we've created the pool, and then what happens? We don't really understand why we created the pool and what the loss, does it correlate, which means that we may not understand our model. We are responsible for that. We're responsible for explaining why we have the pools that we have. And that comment on addressing large loans in the portfolio with the prior. These are some things that we find under purpose. Um, inputs, lack of understanding of the general inputs, impaired, Q factors, unallocated. Um, you know, sometimes, and I threw all those together in a single sentence, but we often find that there's not a good understanding of why we, uh, 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 for example, what our Q factors are. Why do you have the Q factors we have? Well, if you read the guidance, it tells us we have what? How many, is it 14, 10, nine, that's it. Nine, okay, so what do we do? We create nine Q factors. Do we create 10? No, do we create eight? Why do we create nine? Well, it's right there in the guidance. The word's guidance, it's not requirement. But you need to state why do you have the Q factors you have? How do you support them? What do they correlate to? Um, Q factor is an environmental factor, right?
poor IT controls. Um, that, that goes back to that statement that a model may be valid, but may, may fail an audit type process. So we find sometimes in handling the allowance, um, even when the software gets purchased or when we do it, you know, that the first thing that happens is, well, you, how, where does the file come from? Well, we IT emails it to me, okay? And what do you do? I go through and scrub it, look at the different loans in there, then I email it to somebody else, okay? Then what do they do? Well, then they put it out on the server, or they do upload it, <coughs> SageWorks, you know, we get that out there. Well, does anything sound, and, and how do you, we balance a final total, you make sure it balances. What about the individual com com components of that? Could they be wrong, could they be right? Well, you know, there is that kind of lack of, I think that from a validation standpoint, if you're gonna buy software and you're gonna have it, it should really be going into the model and you work with it within the model, not before the model. By the way, it's okay to change values inside a model because these are estimates, these are projections of the future. If something's wrong, it's okay to change it. Um, poor support for cute oh, uh, um, for, uh, lack of adequate grading system. Just the whole, you know, just the whole general grading system, the, the appropriate grading system, especially as you go into a CISA type environment. You know, are you going to be going to expected losses? You're going to be mapping your different grades to different expected loss bands. This is one way of handling it. Um, impaired loan management in there. Where does the data come from? Um, I will say this for MST system. I really like their impaired loan model module in there. I think it's a, because I find in general most banks manage impaired loans in paper files and on computers on people's desks. Does anyone here use the impaired loan module? Use it pretty strongly? Does it help you manage the impaired process? So you keep it, you know, when the loan becomes impaired, it goes in the system, you can update it, you can manage it within there. It's a good automation of a process that's by and large manual. It helps you, helps you get better information about the loan. So if you are using the MST system, I would encourage you to use that module. Because then when it comes around to running your allowance at the end of the quarter, guess what? The data's already there, right? You're already ready for that portion, so you're becoming more efficient. Um, managing the file from the core, talked a bit about that. You know, Jack Henry or Pfizer, whatever, they have a file at the end of the quarter, and how does it come in, how do you work with that? Those are things that affect the validation. Now, a lot of times, as I said, does it make the model invalid? Well, if you were to transform to more of an automated process with less eyes, it probably would at some point. And right now in the environment, it just means that you're inefficient. And that there are things that you need to build up. Transformation. We occasionally find formula errors in Excel um, in some of the calculations. Especially if you've grown and, and, you're, and you're trying to manage through that. The weighting of periods. How do you support those? Why do you, you know, if you're waiting your periods, why do you support the different weights you have? Do you need a straight? Do you, you know, what are you doing in there? Um, uh, pool structures <coughs> in the transformation. Um, do your pools correlate? Are they proper pools? Um, volatility and inherent historical loss periods. How do you account for that? How do you manage that? How does it make your, how does it make your model valid? Triggers volatility. And then this last one was kind of interesting, but smoothing losses by grades to reflect a normal distribution. We've run across this twice already, actually, where the banks will have a higher number in the, let's say, the sixth grade versus the seventh grade, and they want to move that around. They want a higher number in the seventh and the sixth, and they want to they basically leave the totals intact, but they switch the numbers around so that they get a nice normal distribution. So that typically means that they're not managing their, their, uh, their Outputs, um, the unallocated amount, I think, is one of the most interesting things in validation because what the comment we often hear is that how do you determine your unallocated amount? Well, we're told we can't reduce our allowance, so we're going to stick it all in the unallocated portion. How do you support that? We've got this really big book, John. This says it all. So basically, it uh, doesn't really, um, you know, the whole unallocated portion is in some respects getting into, an, into a uh, in, into this expected loss, isn't it? We're saying that 
things are too volatile right now to reduce it, so we're going to support it this way. So those are the kind of things in validation that we see. And then accurate and defensible financials that come out of that, you know, just do you, you know, are the numbers correct? How many times do you manipulate them before they get there? Um, what are the end results? Okay. Inadequate reporting, and then the, the routing is not clearly defined and documented in the results. How does it go around? Who signs off on what? You're going to say, well, is that more of a control? Well, not in a subjective model. It's important who's involved in it. Because if certain people aren't, so they're not identified, or they, or they should be. Uh, so to give you an example, so we had one validation we did where the stated purpose was that the uh, the, the loan committee, uh, the, the director of the uh, executive loan committee had to see and sign off on this for one of directors. Well, it turned out that that step had gotten skipped a few years ago, and now the CFO more or less gave it directly to the board for signing off. And, did the loan committee ever see it? Probably not. And the uh, CFO, while somewhat knowledgeable, um, had taken an important step out of there, which is who's actually managing those credits, not the CFO. Keys to model risk management. Again, these are general, you know, why was the model created? What's the intended purpose? How and who is the model used by? documentation, ensure IT standards are maintained, all very basic nuts and bolts. But again, because the allowance has been something that has been has more or less grown up, it's really moving to this more, uh, moving to this stronger um, modeling process with some of the software providers where you, you went up with good archiving, you went up with good data, and it gives you a much stronger process. Five minutes left. So questions. Modeling will evolve. It's going to get more sophisticated and more difficult. Someone asked me last time, how long does the model validation take? Four to six weeks. Done. Finished. The process. Yeah. You love the model better. Um, you know, I don't think any of the models are truly, are truly accurate from the standpoint of really capturing that incurred loss perspective. I think that, uh, I think that there's a, a lot of, um, right, you know, if you would go back, go back to prior to 2007, there's a really strong emphasis on incurred loss, 2007 to now, it's somewhat a gray area, isn't it? Incurred loss, but let's make sure we've got enough just in case something else happens. So I think that you know, if, if we were to go into another recession, would banks be adequately reserved? Well, the question becomes how much of the old portfolio was there under the terms that were, you know, you start getting into vintage studies and things like that. I think in general, even with the more complex ones, banks don't have in general enough, they don't have enough of their data and information to really understand how that would behave. Well, for the complexity of the models, it's just the, for the sake of having complexity. The only place a complex model might be uh, might be as handy as you can you get into acquired portfolios and you large per, large percentage of acquired portfolios and you're having to do a fair market valuations and things. That's a little different. But if you're a standard commercial bank in today's environment, a deterministic model that archives well and adds and subtracts and does those kind of things and gives you a good you know gives a certain support, it's, it's adequate. <coughs> From my perspective, anybody think anything different or? I think we generally share the same opinion that we've over engineered this process. It's become increasingly more sophisticated with PDs and LDDs and estimated losses and also emergent periods, look back periods and variations with all those different levers. At the end of the day, my reserve coverage is 1.25% or so in our. Um, and that's risk. today's state of modeling. I wouldn't disagree. That's what brings back a comment I heard from a CFO back in the late 90s when we were talking about that point asset liability management and he said you know what i shock it i do whatever things change i still get the same results what's the purpose the purpose is is what for right now what you want to do is you want to get that data together in order to be 
prepared to move to that next stage, which is getting that kind of accuracy and that kind of looking forward into your into your innovation. I remember I was at an RMA forum. A gentleman from the OCC was there, he was second in command, and he made the, the unfortunate comment that basically he says, my boss wants to see every bank around one, if you got a couple loans, one and a half. And I said, well, that's not what you're supposed to be. He goes, oh, I know, I know, I know. Because he said, if that's what you guys really wanted, that's all you have to do, it's a lot easier than going through all this whole process. Typically what they do is they, typically from the examiner's standpoint, because we work with banks under orders, <coughs> they look at the systemic information. I know if that's an examiner's move. But they look at what's going on in your economy and in your general. And they assume that all banks, despite the fact that every bank feels they're better than the other one, from a regulatory standpoint, they all are pretty well impacted by the economy. And then you push it up a bit if they're in trouble and you know, it doesn't ever go down if they're better. It's that kind of measure. But yeah, there's, there, there are benchmarks out there. Yeah, so it's a, yeah. Questions? Is this helpful? You get an idea what validation's going on? Okay. Great. Any questions? I'll be here until Thursday. So I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.